Um, welcome to the, another edition of the Pro Sports Assembly from the C-Suite. I want to thank everybody that's here today. Um, my name is Keisha Wyatt. I'm with the Dallas Mavericks and one of the actual uh, founding board members of the Pro Sports Assembly. I want to send a huge thank you to our founding members and our team partners, which actually we have two that are represented here today, and that's the Miami Dolphins and the San Antonio Spurs. And so today's conversation is going to be about government relations and pro sports. And this conversation is going to be between Jason Jenkins, Senior Vice President of Community Affairs and, Commun and Communications, and Bobby Perez, Executive Vice President and General Counsel for the Spurs Sports and Entertainment. And so today I'm actually really excited for this conversation because we're happy to hear and learn how to cultivate relationships and how those benefit both the public sector and the sports and entertainment industry. So Jason, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you uh, very much and excited about this opportunity to join Pro Sports Assembly and everyone listening today to kind of talk about government relations also, but also learn about more about, uh, you know, Mr. Perez. I mean, kind of looking at his background, an amazing uh, advocate, an amazing leader. And I think it's important and exciting to be able to kind of maybe walk through, uh, you know, his career, learn a little bit more, but also, especially current events, talk about how government and sports can uh, play a role in, in society. And so uh, starting that, I'd like to maybe, Ms. Perez, if you kind of walk you through your background and maybe how you got into your current role here at the Spurs. For sure. And, and Jason, just so long as we can agree, for first name basis, uh, Bobby, please. Um, yeah, I'm, from, I'm from Texas and I saw a lot of Texas people on the call. So that's just sort of how I was raised. <laughs> so uh, I know uh, there might be a couple people from the wrong Texas schools, but just to see, I got my Texas Tech cup. There you know, we go. <laughs> as, we, as we go through. But absolutely, Bobby. All right, man. Thanks. And thanks uh, for everybody to, to join in and appreciate the opportunity to have the discussion today. Uh, this is a, a fun topic uh, and, you know, of interest to a lot of us in our, in our per profession and our careers. We, we, we regularly partner with, with governments as we go out and deliver to our communities. For me, uh, my, I guess, path to pro sports, you know, like everybody, everybody has a little different path, but I, I, I think I started this is maybe year 30 of me being a lawyer. And prior to my time here with the Spurs, my eighth year with the Spurs, probably spent about a decade or so serving as outside counsel for the Spurs in various capacities. Uh, in my early days as a young lawyer, I decided I'd try to learn how to be an elected official. So I, I failed at least one time and you know, wasn't successful at that election. And then eventually served as a San Antonio city council member for a period of years and a great experience, got the opportunity to learn quite a bit about local government, make some really interesting relationships, some that you know have transcended time and I still have today, and also exposed me a lot to how government works with business. Uh, and I enjoyed that very much. After I served my term limit uh, allotment for that during that time, it was four year cap and continued to practice law and represent employers and individuals and companies at, in front of local government, state government, and various transactions, you know, while uh, working at my law firm and work with the Spurs uh, in various capacities. So that's kind of how it started. And that's kind of how I ended up, you know, where, where I'm at uh, at this point in time in my career. No, and that's unique, especially being like a city council person and not saying the sports is a different side, but also but looking at it, what were some of the, the key learnings or things that you learned kind of being uh, going from city council and applying that in government and applying that to the, the team aspect? You know, a great question. I, I think the I think the crossover, you know, like for a lot of us is always relationships. Uh, investing time in your peers, investing time in the people you get to collaborate with, and investing time in, in your efforts. And I think we, we've all been involved in somehow or some fashion. You know, the more we put into something, you know, we all benefit from it and how we're, how we're collaborating. I, I think in my early days as a young elected official, I think I walked in with some preconceived notions about local government about everything that they were, that local government was not doing correctly. And as I learned the system, as I learned the hearts for the people that were serving the community, it was really enlightening. And you, you got to see a lot of great work that's happening every day um, that sometimes the public doesn't get to see. And that was really uh, 
really eye-opening. And, and so I took some lessons from some of those long-serving public officials, long-time public servants, and just watched on how they worked to make the place that they lived and work better for everybody. Uh, and so that uh, I see in sports today, and I know you do it. I know all everybody on our call does it as we work and engage for our main product. Probably a main product today for many of us is our community. And how are we working in and with and supporting and learning from our community? And so I think those are real two big similarities, you know, that really community based focus. Yeah, I think I think like you mentioned, like building coalitions, whether it's fans, constituents, you know, running for office. Is there, a, is there a connection between that in terms of the service of the fans, the community, compared to how, how you did when you were kind of running for office? Yeah, I, another super question. I, I think we all kind of come from the perspective of we're in a, a service industry, we're in a people service industry, and we want to make sure we're always making that fan experience the best that we can. And, and sometimes that takes a lot of work. I, I would analogize that to the political servant or the public servant. You know, that community service or that citizen experience is so important in whether you're passing your public budgets, you're de de developing your community services, you're engaging at that very grassroots level of that that 20 person neighborhood organization, you know, and trying to make sure you're figuring out what their needs are, whether they're health and safety or whether they're parks or whether they're, you know, just basic services, trash pickup in streets. And for, for us, you know, in, in pro sports, it's the same thing. We want folks to have a great experience when they're walking or driving up to our facilities and, you know, all the way through and even when they leave. And, and trying to learn how we do it after in a virtual way. Now, uh, sort of going through it, I know you've been with the team, I believe, eight, eight or nine, eight or nine years in terms yeah. of being with the Spurs. This is my eighth season. Eighth season. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, so, uh, go ahead. No, time flies. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, time flies, and it seems like yesterday. But yeah, it, it goes, it goes by quick. And as everybody knows, the last 15, 16 months have been, uh, been unique. You know, no question. And kind of, uh, you know, talking about you know, to, that, to that end, you know, going through this pandemic as we're, as we're still in, you know, how, how has that shaped an impact, you know, in your industry? I know from, from the outside looking in, it looks like basketball, you know, they kind of started with, went through the bubble, managed that, got to, you know, got to their, uh, their championship season, condensed, condensed season and going right back again. How is that from a, from an organization aspect, but also from a government aspect, was there, how do you manage, you know, that process? And that's still ongoing. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, we we have all, I, we refer to it as kind of that daily roller coaster. I think when we look at San Antonio, Texas, our region, um, from March 12th, from the start of the pandemic, to when the NBA closed down, at the time we had an American Hockey League franchise that closed down that weekend. We had a USL uh, second division soccer franchise that closed down that same weekend. Uh, our NBA G League just stopped playing and then formally closed down a little later. We have probably had a combination of local orders, county orders, state orders in the 60 to 65 range. And so they would just come out so frequently and change our operational cadence. We, we also, like many, went to a work from home mode immediately. And so it's been hectic. Uh, and then when we return to play, everybody has, has had this experience, getting our coaches, our athletes, our game day staff, uh, our sales teams, everybody that's working, how, how are we doing it in a thoughtful way? And so just until recently, January was, you know, late January for us is when we had our first events with fans at a very reduced capacity, you know, probably at a 17% capacity. Uh, so it, it's, it's been a journey. Uh, and unfortunately, we got knocked out not too long ago in the playing game. And so it's interesting to watch how some of you out there are operating right now with maximum capacities. Exciting. The future is, is close. Yeah, it's interesting on those timelines and how the NBA and I work in the NFL with the Dolphins in our timeline. Uh, you can't say like it was great, but like it's been, you know, I think our timeline has been a little different in terms of not being in season 
you know, in the heart of it. So, uh, you know, we're working to try to go to 100% capacity when the season started. We kind of got through our season uh, with no fans, uh, you know, for the most part, league-wide. At the Dolphins, we had about 15,000, but it's, it's, it's obviously been a journey, you know, as well throughout sports. And I think it also can show how sports can kind of bring people together, you know, during these times. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I, and I, I think, you know, all the, the financial pressures that we see in our companies, but then that was very evident in our communities. I, I think immediately one of the things that really jumped out is, at us as an organization, we think of all our part-time family members here that, that work really hard at our events and have been with us for a long time. Season stops and all of a sudden, some for some it's that second job or that third job, you know, where they're making ends meet and, you know, some their only job. And all of a sudden they're without events, you know, for a couple of months and trying to address those, those uh, really basic community needs. And then not to mention all the other things that popped up when we all moved to a virtual world. I know watching many of you across the country doing some really great things for your communities inspired, I know inspired us. No, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't say enough about that. And, and I agree for us, I mean, I can only imagine in basketball with the amount of, amount of uh, games. I know for us at the Dolphins, we uh, fancy ourselves as sort of like a global entertainment destination. So we have big events, uh, Miami Open, which was lost. Uh, you know, we had uh, different concerts, different events, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it was it was tough seeing a lot of uh, people that would work at the stadium, especially in our local community in and around our stadium, not being able to have that. You know, for us, we tried to, we created a, um, a food relief program. And so we had uh, each day, uh, we, we would deliver, a, have a thousand meals come out of our stadium to kind of keep our center plate, our uh, food and beverage provider engaged and employed during that time. And we try to bring our part-time out uh, staff to come out to sort of help and distribute the food. But what also we kind of learned through this is that uh, we were able to uh, work with uh, work with local minority-owned restaurants in and around our community to kind of to, to create and distribute those meals and paying them kind of kept the lights on during those times. So we uh, obviously stumbled upon it, but it was a inter it was a way to kind of show a community impact and benefit in terms of the intentionality of our spending that we're going to carry on and going for, forward as well too, which kind of helped us, uh, you know, do this. I, I, will, I will tell you, we 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 saw that. Uh, we thought it was really cool, and we emulated a similar similar uh, program here in San Antonio. I, I think some of the things that we saw other teams do across the country, whether it was uh, activating voting locations, whether it was uh, you know helping with the digital divide gaps, uh, you know, then or some of the neat things when we got to the summer doing virtual camps for, for kids, uh, whether they're soccer camps or basketball camps. And that was uh, quite a learning curve for our group, you know, but it, the reception was fantastic. You know, having kids all from all over the world join in for the virtual basketball camp or the virtual soccer camp and a lot of fun. And uh, thanks to you all for just doing it because we got to you know take advantage of learning from you all. Now, so kind of, again, you had talked about, you know, eight years and through those eight years, two presidential campaigns, I think obviously countless local, uh, state and, and, and regional uh, elections, like what kind of change have, have you seen and how does that impact you at the Spurs when, uh, when, when you have this turnover, when you're working with different officials, how, how does that work in the, in the context of that, knowing that you've kind of been there through a couple of cycles? So I, here's maybe just some background to, to maybe better answer the question. So our NBA facility uh, is owned by our county. And so we're the benefactors of a long-term operational agreement. So we get to operate and run it with, with their permission. Our outdoor facility, which has 9,000 seats and 12 full-size soccer fields is owned by the county and the city. And so we're, we're the benefactors of that, you know, same structure in a long-term lease. So e even though we've got years left, it's just those, that regular cadence and making sure that we're managing those relationships. So managing the relationships at the city side, our city council members come in and out every two years. Uh, we've had the same mayor over the last, you know, six years. And so we've had a couple of mayors to work with. Our county side's a little bit more long-term, generally the same county judge and commissioner's court uh, with a few changes. And so I, I think maintaining those relationships, staying active in front of them, uh, reporting to them, even when you don't need to, I think that's kind of one of the things that we've done. That's uh, one of you know our group's areas that we stay involved in. And then our state, 
although we don't directly report to them, but it's that provides that enabling legislation that impacts how tickets are sold, it impacts how stadiums are run, it impacts how alcohol is you know, distributed. In Texas, we also, and you guys have probably seen some of the press, you know, there's, you know, you can carry a weapon in Texas if you get a license. That of course impacts our facilities and our events, keeping our eyes in that. There's a lot of legislation right now in our legislature meets uh, every two years. So they're in session and this is the last week and so we got to continue to monitor that. And so all those things impact business, but it also impacts sports business. Um, and we got to continue to watch, monitor, and engage, uh, you know, when necessary. Now, has that like uh, evolved since you joined the organization? But those same tenants remain the same no matter when you start. You know, how long you've been there in, in terms of uh, the communication, the keys to be successful in that on that front. I think here's a good way to answer it. Our, we've had this current facility since 2000, and we did a major renovation in 2015. So I would say the big lifting you know, was the 2013, 2014, 2015 era, era to get our renovations approved, to get them funded. And so there was a lot of work you know, coming up to that. We're 10 years out from the expiration of our management agreement. So there's active discussions regarding our MBA practice facility on the cycles we're going through. And of course, when we closed down, you know, for the, the pandemic, we had to make sure we're keeping our local government involved and aware. On the city side, it's a new relationship, which we started in 2015 when we acquired the soccer club and uh, regular, you know, building, you know, more relationships, not only with those elected officials, but that professional staff that's, that's really, you know, doing a lot of the work and doing all the, the final recommendations before approval. So yeah, that, that's cons consistent. Um, our state side, um, you know, but Laura Dixon, who all you guys know well, was, was key when she was with our organization in making sure that we were getting approvals at the state level to help us have 50-50 raffle in our buildings. And, and that's, transitioned over time. It's been very successful for our foundation, uh, our Spurs Give Foundation, and is actually getting enhanced, hopefully this week. You know, we had some more bill passage, so there's some good things happening there as well. And, and how is uh, your structure set up um, throughout your organization? Like, how many people are on your team? How, how, does, how does that work from a structure? Sure. Uh, for organizationally, we probably have about, you know, 400 full-time folks, you know, for all our, all our properties. And our part-time group runs about, in a non-COVID year, our part-time group runs about 800 to 900, just, you know, doing all the event support. Uh, at our level, as the EVP and general counsel, corporate relations, our, our oversight is, you know, of course, legal affairs, uh, you know, government relations for all our companies. Uh, you know, as well as our corporate regulations. In addition to that, I kind of manage and oversee our facilities, our soccer operations, uh, and then the traditional risk things that you would, you know, kind of line up, whether that's human resources and, you know, some of our benefits side, and then work with all our other business unit leaders. For the government piece, uh, we have a team that's kind of in an evolution stage. Laura recently, you know, made a change. She was uh, very critical and helpful to us over, over many years. She and I got to work together for a long time. And that was a great experience for us and good byproduct for our organization. But we're going through a transition mode where I'm actively searching for, you know, some uh, new help on our legal team. And I think we made some decisions today for some new young leaders. And so we're evolving and that's going to help us. I think one of our big issues is sports gaming in Texas will not pass this session. We see it in a lot of our states. And uh, I, I think sports gaming is eventually will happen, but all the teams and in, in leagues are working on it in Texas as this session ends, but we're going to work for the interim session to hopefully get that ready for next session. Now, you know, talking about the structure, I mean, how important is uh, committed ownership? And obviously you have a lot of areas that you oversee. I mean, how, how important is it to have uh, ownership and leadership that recognize and value that and 
and seek seek the counsel when you know when you give it. I I think one thing that that we really work hard at, uh, and like a, a lot of your teams, is is making sure that we're as transparent as possible with each other. Uh, we have a real open dialogue, no matter where you sit in the organization. We try to make sure we have a discussion and, and a healthy debate, and and really avoid decisions based on any sort of hierarchy, right? So trying to take some input. Uh, I, my hats are off to, to our ownership group. I, I mean, they've done some things that uh, are so community driven, so community focused. They've taken some positions that were not about the bottom line, but really about the community. And I think that's the way they see, you know, working with our local government. You know, they are always engaging. They do, and our leadership all across the table does so many different things in our community that are not related to our team, whether they're out advocating for jobs, advocating for workforce development, uh, challenging us to make sure we're engaging with those people in the community that have needs. And, and that happens on a regular basis. And they definitely lead by example and they give us an opportunity to just do the right thing. And, and so that is, uh, you know, refreshing and, and always knowing that you have that support and, and that's, that's our kind of baseline. So that's really a, really a, a great, great point. Thanks for asking that question. And that's awesome. And, and obviously, whatever you do, I mean, you know, that's key to, to come in and be able to have that seat, uh, communicate, be respected. But I, I love what you talked about in terms of it doesn't matter where an idea comes from. It doesn't matter where things, it, it's all about getting to like the right outcome and else, right solution. So it's great that you talk about that cross functional leadership and that communication. I mean, it, it sounds like obviously that's something that uh, can empower your staff, especially some people that may not be in what they, what they might think of positions of change. And, you know, we're we're two years into a new leadership group over here, and uh, many of you have had the chance to meet R.C. Buford, who is our long-term general manager uh, in, in partners with our head coach, Greg Popovich, for many years. But R.C. is now our CEO, and, uh, you know, his approach to team building, his approach to collaboration, you know, we're really making it a goal to use those concepts that were so successful on the court for so long, but trying to really uh, engage, create, develop some high-performing teams. Great lessons, and he's given us lots of flexibility to, to learn and, and uh, not have fear of failure and go out and try to do the best that we can. Now, I know, um, you know, from a um... From a nation perception uh, aspect, you know Texas. And, you know, I, I grew up actually in Texas, Missouri City. I went to Texas Tech. Grew up in Houston. Love Texas. Missed the food. Everything about it. You know. I know you say you're going to eat today. Hopefully, you haven't uh, eaten anything today. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, going go go there, bro. I got you, man. I got you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I know uh, Texas and Florida, just from a national political landscape, are often you know compared, you know, in, in political conversation. So. Uh, I just kind of want to get some of your thoughts on that, but also going down into an issue like capacity, like what, what were some of those conversations like? I know for us, uh, our, our governor here, uh, you know, Ron DeSantis had talked about wanting to be 100% uh, open, you know, from the beginning. I know we had some internal conversations and, uh, you know, on that as well, but just, but just, uh, just kind of want to get your thoughts just in terms of uh, the view of both states. I mean, it, that's a great topic that we spend a lot of time trying to understand. So I, I think for those of you that are in Texas, you're, you're familiar with this. Our urban areas, I, I would say, are a lot of them are 50-50 or you know, border on blue communities. Our uh, rural areas are you know, more red. Uh, and our state government, you know, generally you know, Republican you know, leaning. And so, un unfortunately, you know, I think for a lot of us as, as operators, when we got into the pandemic discussion, some of it became politicized, a lot of it became politicized. And our leagues, I, I think, stepped up, you know, all, all the leagues stepped up and you know, we're really trying to, you know, fall on the side of public health. And we'll just take the NBA as an example, you know, closed down real quickly, stopped events real quickly, held uh, in Florida in the summer, right? The bubble was our return to play. A uh, very tight, constrained uh, event to try to keep people safe and healthy, but yet returning some play. And as we were trying to engage for the following year, the NBA kept a pretty tight set of rules on on fans, on masks, on health protocols, not only for players and coaches, but also for 
team staff, employees, you know, event staff. So we were always operating under those restricted rules. And however, as you mentioned, Florida, Texas, uh, Texas quickly went to expanded capacities, permitting broader rules on mass events. And as teams, I mean, we had to kind of make a make a call on what should we do, how should we do it. In in coordination with the the NBA, you know, they had that constraint that they set on us. So there was a lot of discussion on it, a lot of healthy debate, and. Uh, and I am glad that we're at where we are today, that the vaccine is out and lots of uh, people are volunteering to get it. And it's really helping us get back to a little bit more normal than we have been in a long time. No, that's great. I know for us, our, our vice chairman, Tom Garfinkel, his, uh, his point of view was like, you know, we're not the experts in this space to begin with. Our health and safety is going to lead the way, just like you talked about. So we worked with a a group, the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council, and got yeah. a certification, you know, with them because we wanted to have like a third party to come in and kind of navigate, navigate that, and really establish top down, you know, our practices with the hope of, you know, trying to get better out of it. So uh, that that was a a big deal for us. And again, we we were about fifteen thousand when again in the 66,000 uh, seat space, but you know, just like everyone else, social distancing, doing those things, we eliminated tailgating because that was. Yeah. Obviously, it's a big part yeah. of football, but uh, it would be tough to come in and say we want you to act right, you know, inside. But like outside, you know, it's kind of you know wide open. And we uh, talked to some of our local officials, and we that's frankly one of the biggest things we got pushback on from the tailgating. But it, for us, it was an easy decision in terms of you know the health and safety, you know, with that. You know, the, you raise you raise some pretty good points, and it, it, it makes me think of your earlier question. I, I think we immediately got on a cadence with our county judge and our mayor just trying to achieve alignment and even for our non-NBA regulated activities. And so those discussions are really helpful in working with our local health officials. You know, we had a, a good cross-functional team internally that developed, you know, a pandemic plan, you know, just help guide our entire organization and where we should be based on the metrics. We had the benefit of some experts. That was one of the things we did also, just who, who knows what they're doing in this space. And so reaching out to those uh, health experts that serve some of the biggest institutions in the country, that was probably one of the first things that we did. And, you know, had uh, his name is Dr. Marty McCarty, and he, he, he still guides us today on helping us how we're resuming and returning to work. And he is consulting with lots of people across the country, but we're still actively involved in that phase. And even as we are coming out of it, trying to understand the mask programs and protocols with the prevalence of the vaccine. You know, our state rule is, you know, also fairly new within the last couple of weeks on masks in public facilities or facilities that have public funds. And so we got to be conscious of those as well. So I know a lot of people obviously with Pro Sports Assembly uh, are on this call or either in this field or looking to get in. Like if for, in your role, what would be the thing that would surprise most people about even if you work in sports, what's the most surprising thing that you think people would think about in your space? That's a good question. I, I, will, I will tell you the, and I, I don't think this would surprise anybody about the cadence of the business. Incredibly fast, always moving. Every day is a different day. Uh, but I, I will share with you that, I, and this may not surprise you, but the the complexity of the, the deals that we all work on they're having had the benefit to be in private practice for 20 years before I showed up here. They're just as complex, if not more. And, but what's, what makes it all go, in my opinion, is just the amazing relationships across not only this country, but we get to work a little bit in Mexico because of our proximity. Those are amazing relationships. And there is nothing that can't be solved just by working through those and understanding and everybody willing to share a little bit of the risk uh, in hopes for a really good, solid partnership. And uh, so maybe not surprising, but really a real curative, collaborative way to address those issues. Now, I know you uh, you kind of touched on it a little earlier about uh, decisions and advocating and and as in this role of uh, social justice, especially always, always throughout, it's always been something that we should be thinking about, you know, talking about, working towards. 
you know, and, and going there. But also, I think, you know, the pandemic, current events, different things kind of lay clear some divides. And obviously, these divides are at most times political, you know, in, you know, in terms of it. Um, your organization is obviously known as one of the most socially conscious, led by you, led by your coach, you know, who openly, um, you know, talks about issues. The team is uh, very active as well. Kind of maybe kind of like walk us through organizationally uh, how that how that's worked, and then uh, second, uh, from a political aspect, how have you kind of managed uh, managed that from a political corporate partner, you know, et cetera. Well, I don't have to remind anybody on this call what, what, how this world turned when George Floyd was killed. And so the amazing thing, I, we, you're right, our pop is one of our institutional leaders and he was, has been and continues to be incredibly vocal on, in many fronts, whether it's police reform or, or whether it's just the health and state of, of play in, you know, in, our, in our region and our world. But here's where it got expanded you know, as an organization uh, and it, hats off again to our ownership, R.C. Buford, Pop, of course. Uh, they made a conscious effort to sit down and just have a, a, a long conversation with our, our group. And our group meaning everybody. Uh, everybody that was, that was willing, dialed in, a big Zoom call, if you will. And it was just a conversation to talk about you know, we always talk about letting our people, we all do this in all our companies, letting people show up to work as how they are. And for a lot of us, it's it's easier said than done. But that's what that conversation was. And it was, you know, over a long period of time and everybody from coaches to, you know, staff uh, showed up and just talked about their experiences in their life and how they were feeling at that point in time. And it didn't stop there, it continued. Um, and we focused on the black community at one point in time, we focused on our Asian community, we focused on our Latino community, uh, and we continue to do it. And so we, we started an internal series called Spurs Give, uh, Spurs Voices, I'm sorry. And that's on our Spurs YouTube channels. I mean, I invite you to take a look at it. But I think one of the most moving moments is when our owner shows up and supports all of this. And so I think we all, you know, and he's our main investor. And I know we're working through some terminology, but Peter J. Holt, you know, shows up and supports our staff and supports our community and in some of the most moving moments of, for people, you know, and, uh, and we're still, it has spillover effect on all sides, right? Not everybody's always, you know, ready and open to hear everything, but we continue to talk about it. And I hope uh, we continue to keep on doing it and challenging ourselves as individuals uh, to do the right thing. And so that's been, it's personally been impactful for me uh, as, uh, you know, as a Latino male, you know, we all have dealt with things at different times in our lives, but it's, it's impactful and it's really neat to see. And we look forward to keep on having those discussions. No, I think I think the Spurs voice is, uh, you know, was great. You know, I've been checking those out, and you're being very modest right now because yours was amazing as well too. So don't don't sell yourself, you know, uh, you know, short on that. And uh, and one of the things I know you talked about that I love to maybe expand for the group. You talked about the process of learning how to be accepted without judgment or fear of being rejected. So that's one of the things I think that resonated with me. You know, when I heard this as a African American executive, you know, you know, in this industry, maybe if you kind of maybe want to expand upon your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, thanks. And um, it's always not easy to talk about, right? But I think as as we, uh, no matter where you are in life, you all, we're always looking to be uh, accepted. Uh, but when you're given the opportunity to show up, who you are and how you are. It really changes the day. And so I think maybe some of the experiences I've shared with you know some of my teammates here is when I was a young, young lawyer or a young elected official, I'd walked in some places, right, that I probably felt that I wasn't, you know, accepted uh, just because of the neighborhood I grew up in, or maybe the schools I went to, or maybe the way I looked. Uh, and so I, I think we carry that, you know, all our lives. And I, I think you know, as we work to, we have the opportunity, you know, because we work, all of us, we all work for some cool brands and people look up to that. And I think when we can go out and 
I engage with folks, even people younger than us, they see that and they say, hey, I, I, I can do that too. And I think if we're just doing that little small part, it really makes a difference. And so as we go out and invest our time in our community, especially in some of our more challenged areas, you know, for us in San Antonio, uh, we, we've got a lot of those challenged areas. And so when we can go visit with those, you know, young people, those young leaders, whether they're in our churches or our neighborhoods, it, it makes an impact. Uh, and, and so I think sometimes we probably get caught up in our day to day of great fan experiences and wins and losses. But I think that's one thing that we can never forget on how we can really impact people's lives. So kind of going going through that, when you talk about not going in, in specific conversations, but being, you know, being a lawyer, having your background, were, were there any like risk management issues you looked at from wearing your lawyer hat or, or, or was there was there um, any trepidation or anything going along with with taking some of these, uh, to, you know, taking a stand or going through, uh, you know, some of these things? Oh, yeah, you, I, that's another great question, too. And uh, I think constantly you always have to look at that, uh, especially when you're uh, in a policy making position or a policy recommending pos position for an organization. And so, yeah, we sat around and we talked about it. And and I think when we if we all rely on our, our corporate values or company values at the end of the day, and I think we all probably share similar values, but one of our borders is just making sure we're doing the right thing. And if we're able to rest on that, I think we can always figure out a way on how to allow healthy conversations like that. And then, you know, if there's any byproduct that becomes a risk, then I think it's again, sitting down and having those discussions and problem solving. That's great. I mean, and uh, kind of going, going uh, towards, you know, the future, I know, uh, you know, the playoffs are, you know, uh, going on, looking to, looking to hopefully, uh, vaccinations and better you know better results and trying to move, move forward uh as we go up to 2021 and go on 22 like, but what's the future like where, where do you see what, what are some of the big things uh you know you're thinking about and and in terms of this uh in terms of your position and work and how can we move forward for you know the upcoming year i i think you know when we uh did not win the the play-in game for us right our our off season started so we've got a uh, draft position coming up soon. We got a draft coming up on the NBA side. We our soccer season is is underway. So our second division USL team, we you know three points on Saturday night. So that's great. Makes this week great. We got another match this coming weekend, uh, and then really working with all our internal cross functional teams. Uh, you know our, we've always had a robust stadium concert business that's been gone for you know 15, 16 months. Uh, rebuilding that, the bookings are coming back, and then really strategizing with our other teams on how we're going to return to work as a company. You know, I think we've learned a lot of great things out of the pandemic, and one of them is the remote work environment. We weren't good at it at all beforehand, and uh, I think we're going to take some of these learnings and we'll be applying them. And I think we'll be a company like many of yours going forward in the future. You're going to have a good blend of you know, remote workers, of workers every day, and then people that just like to do it remote and still can be highly productive. And so we're excited about those things. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, I mean, as, as we go in, oh, uh, go into the question uh, Q and A uh, part of this, any any uh, key takeaway that you would love for the people that are listening here to, to you know take away uh, from your role and your role, government relations, policy work, et cetera. I, I, I think one of the things is just to, I'm, I'm fortunate to work with a, a lot of good people that are always challenging me to continue to be curious, uh, to, you know, try to be, you know, open uh, to different ideas and you no know, matter where they come from, whether it's, you know, the new person that comes in tomorrow or the person that's been here with us for 20 years. And, and so trying to make sure we're all learning and learning together. That's awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, Keisha, any, uh, any questions on your end? I should know to unmute myself after being at home for 14 months or 15 months. <laughs> so I always get caught up in that. No, great conversation um, from the both of you. And I definitely, you know, obviously being, I'm in Dallas, Texas for you guys that are watching and being with, you know, an organization with the NBA, I can also say that, you know, the NBA took a, 
a real big, you know, loud, you know, microphone at the beginning of, you know, the incident with George Floyd and we really amplified, you know, our voices and our players and I think from a government standpoint, you know, just to see how it all ties in together and the social justice and, you know, the laws that are being implemented, hopefully, you know, I think there are Congress, don't get me in the political talk. I don't know much about it, but I do know that there are laws, you know, hopefully becoming an act soon. So um, definitely just want to ask a question for the both of you all, honestly, and that being, you know, some parting advice that you want to give to our viewers. You know, you both have had successful careers as executives with professional sports team. Jason, you being on the NFL side, it's completely different from the NBA side. I would love just to hear that parting, you know, words for that person that is striving to get where you are today. So, and especially as two men that happen to be minorities, I think it's a beautiful thing to see the two of you all um, in positions that what the Pro Sports Assembly really represents, and that is ensuring that leaders that are people of color have the opportunity to be in these positions. So. Definitely want to just ask that question, some parting advice or just any kind of help that you could provide for those, those folks watching. Well, I guess I guess from my perspective, is, is being a part of organizations like this, I mean, Pro Sports Assembly was founded, you know, with the idea of inclusiveness, of diversity, helping others and networking, I think, uh, and having mentorships. Like, no one has ever gotten to where, where they could be without, without a mentor. I've had plenty in my life, uh, you know, that have helped me get the opportunity to interview for positions and obviously the work is what's going to keep you there uh, but I would say just be a you know a continuous learner uh, try to try to learn from every situation that you can uh, you know from from a crisis management aspect here at the Dolphins we, we've had a lot and so I've always tried to be prepared kind of I have like a listing of different things that I've worked on but more importantly learning from other situations both good and bad and what you can take away from it and so I think uh, for me it's always trying to be a continuous learner work it just sounds corny but kind of like do the job that you're supposed to that you're supposed to do that your job description outlines and then try to exceed that and try to use your role to help to help others help others as well and that's kind of served served me well you know in terms of that. i've been fortunate enough uh you know through through the, my career to have a lot of people that kind of looked out for me but i also put myself in a position to be looked out for by being humble uh work you know working being collaborative not being territorial and kind of just finding out the organization mission that you believe in and really kind of working towards that. I, I, I love to hear Jason's answer on that. I, I, I'm just going to jump on that and just underscore his, his crisis management abilities. I think anybody that is able to manage and handle crisis in a cool, calm way, uh, offer opportunities, multiple decisions and willing to hopefully and not in a defensive manner, right? Get engaged in a discussion it benefits the whole. And if we can always remember that, you know, you're a, a team teammate, team member and a colleague, you know, you can always get things done. I think for, for us too, the, you know, those with a little bit more gray hair, I think we should always remember our obligation and responsibility. Again, taking a note from Jason, right. To be mentors, we we're we're here by the graces of many others. And, uh, and if we can make sure we're always helping folks out when you can, you know, it, it just, uh, you know, pay it forward, as they say, right? And, and so I think that's probably something that we should all try to do. Awesome. Well, again, thank you both so much um, for today's conversation. Um, definitely want to encourage, you know, for the individuals that are watching today, if you're not a Pro Sports Assembly member, please ensure to come be become a member and visit prosportsassembly.org. Uh, some of our conversations are starting to become private and intimate conversations. And so want to ensure that you're a part of also that transition to where these public events that we do have, just know that if you become a member, you'll be invited to the table, so to speak. Um, so definitely feel free to, again, go to prosportsassembly.org. And again, I want to thank uh, Jason and Bobby for today's conversation. Uh, so excellent and really helpful to learn more about the both of you all. So Thank you all and thank you all for watching.